Yes. When, other than that, Judy, is that in the set? Is the test paper size that it takes? Yeah, yeah, it's like, all right. It's like, all right, if we take the x-ray of your foot and then we're like, all right, this is how we're gonna size up your shoe for you. Or they make it to the, or yeah, make, they make it to, it to your fit. Yeah. They fit the shoe to your, to the size or the shape of your foot, supposedly. Right, did it actually have any benefits? Nah. I mean, I don't know, my shoes fit just fine without needing x-rays, so. It was just, you know, it was just a way to use technology to make things sound fancy. Probably those who have gout, what, what do you call them and all, and if you have deformity and all that, then maybe it will then. Just, just, just read some rumor, right? <laughs> <laughs> but just measure out the foot normally. It's fine, it's fine. Okay, X-ray stove polish. Yes, that's right, our stove polish. <laughs> Created with X-rays to clean your stove better. Does that actually ex no, that, is that actually a thing? No, it no. is just an advertisement. No, it's just an advertisement, right? It's just a way to make something sound fancy and technological. That it was that didn't actually work. It's not actually a thing. Like blinker fluid. You like know, what? Never heard of that. No, blinker I fluid. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> X-ray headache tablets. All right, our headache tablets created with x-rays to help you <laughs> cure headaches. Probably give them. No, that's not a thing. Probably that's not how x-rays work. Mm -hmm. Right, but it was new back then, right? People didn't know what x-rays were. It's just, oh, it's fancy, it's x-rays, it's new. Okay, yeah. so, uh -huh. right, false advertisement. Right, false advertisement. X-rays didn't do anything. Yeah, but had, they, it's in the sense that if you want headaches, you have x-rays. If you want, yeah, yeah best, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but as you can see, right, x-rays used to be advertised as a cure-all, as a thing, as something that could do anything, right? It was, it was a miracle worker, but no, we, no x-rays aren't actually like that. Okay. And back then, people did not understand the dangers of x-rays, right? Because x-rays, you can't see them, you can't smell them, you can't hear them, you can't taste them, you can't touch them, right? So your normal five senses, right, they do nothing to tell you about x-rays. And the damage from x-rays is usually long-term. It doesn't usually show up immediately. It happens over a period of time. So people didn't realize or didn't immediately connect x-rays to damage. So early dangers, we had acute radio dermatitis. This is, oh wait, say radiation burns. Right? Overexposure to radiation caused the skin to become red, being a rash, right? Radiation burns. Electrocution, because what do we need to make x-rays? Well, we need a lot of power. And if you didn't properly set up the equipment, you could electrocute yourself or that technologist. Thomas Edison himself, suffered radiation burns to his face because he was working with the fluoroscope. His assistant, Clarence Daly, suffered severe radiation burns and ended up having his left arm above the elbow and right arm at the shoulder amputated. Right? And at that point, Thomas Edison swore off x-rays altogether. Right? He would not do any more research into x-rays because of this. Yes. Is that his wife, Karen? Well, his assistant eventually did die because of that. Is that Rankin's wife, Karen? No, that is not Rankin's mm -hmm. wife, Karen. This is the hand of an early radiologist or radiologic technologist. So someone that used to work with x-rays, right? Because they didn't shield themselves. They didn't know that they needed lead shielding. So they would always be working with the equipment. And eventually, the radiation would cause burns and would cause the need for amputation. Right, so if you were in this profession 120 years ago, this might have been your fate. Right? It's a good thing that we now have more research and we understand radiation safety. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about the first thing. Did they go to like school or just get like random training? Mm -hmm. or how uh, well, yeah. back then it was more random training. Right? <laughs> Things weren't as professionalized as it is now. 
what was the AmeriCorp uh, Reckon machine, or was that a person, or? Uh, so this here is um, the journal that oh, the picture okay. was taken from. So the American Quarterly Reckon mm -hmm. that makes sense. journal. Okay. So, have respect for radiation. Right? You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it. But it is there, it can be dangerous. Yes, Emily? Uh, we don't have the cemeteries yet. Yeah. Correct, we still don't have the cemeteries. Uh, They're still on the way. Uh, okay. We'll just stay behind. Yes. <laughs> just, be, just take your normal precautions. You should never be in the room while an X-ray is going off. Just, or don't be in like clear line of sight of the tube, right? Always be behind a window or something like that when the X-ray goes off. Okay. Um, let's see. So units of measure. So now we're going to get more into the science stuff, right? We've talked about units before, but in terms of scientific units, we have something called fundamental quantities. Fundamental, right? Basis. This is the building block for all other quantities. You cannot get any smaller or any more specific than these quantities. So the main ones that the book lists are mass, length, and time, right? You have a gram of something. That's mass. You have a meter, right? That's length. You have a second. That's time. Okay. And we can use these fundamental quantities to create new units. For example, if you're talking about the unit of speed, what unit do you use to measure speed with? Miles. Miles is a unit of speed? Oh, yeah. How fast are you going? Minutes. Meters. Right. Great. So if you're driving your car, right? 60 miles an hour, right? That's your measurement of speed. Or you could do meters per second if you're using the metric system. Right? So let's break that down. Miles per hour. Miles, what is that? Distance. A unit of length, right? Hours, what is that? A unit of time. So speed is made of length and time. Do you see that? So speed is not a fundamental quantity, but it's made of fundamental quantities. So all our other units are based off our fundamental quantities. Does that make sense? Now, there are other fundamental quantities in addition to these three. For example, the quantity for electric current, for thermodynamic temperature, for the amount of substance, for luminous intensity, right? So these are also fundamental quantities, um, but they're not so important. They're a little bit more specific. They're not as widely relevant. Right? right, so for example, um, for current, right, you'll have amps. Or for thermodynamic temperature, you have Celsius or Kelvin, technically. Uh, for amount of substance, you have something called the mole. And for luminous intensity, you have the candela. Okay, so these are all like the base <laughs> units that we can use and manipulate to create new units. Mm -hmm. All right, so right, we have the British system, the imperial system, pound, foot, second. That's what we're used to here in the US. Okay, But when dealing with science or when working on the international stage, it's better to use the metric system, the system international. Right, so kilogram, meters, second. So this is what we are primarily dealing with. Okay, so mass, the amount of stuff in something, that is kilograms, right? Length, meters, and then time, well, seconds. Cool. Yes. All right, so let's talk a little bit about mass. How do we define mass? Mass is the quantity of matter contained in an object. Do not confuse mass with weight, because they are different. What is the difference between mass and weight? 
Veronica, what do you think? Gravity has an effect on it? Gravity has an effect on which one? Weight. Gravity has an effect on weight. Very good. So, if I'm here on Earth, I have a certain mass. I also have a certain weight. If I go into space where there's no gravity or minimal gravity, my mass stays the same, but my weight changes. My weight decreases in space because there's no gravity up there, right? I'm going to be floating around in space. So my weight is different, but my mass is the same. Okay, so mass is something that is constant as long as the object does not change. It is about the amount of matter, the amount of stuff inside that object. Okay? What is matter? Right? It's anything that occupies space, has shape or form, and has mass. So stuff. Any stuff that you can think of is matter. If it's not stuff, then it's not matter, right? So um, for mass, the metric unit is the kilogram. The kilogram is defined as the mass of 1,000 cubic centimeters of water at 4 degrees Celsius. This is how we determine what one kilogram is. It used to be that one kilogram was the weight of some metal bar sitting in a bank vault in Paris. But that's kind of a silly way to measure things. Right, so this is now the scientific definition of one kilogram. Right, because if you have a metal bar sitting in a vault in Paris, and someone swaps out that bar, right, and now the weight, it has a different mass, you can't, you can't really recreate your old unit. But anyone can grab a thousand cubic centimeters of water, bring it down to four degrees Celsius, and weigh or measure the amount of mass. So are we okay with the concept of mass? Yeah, okay, good. Next up, length, measure of distance. This is two dimensions, right? From point A to point B, nice and easy. One meter is defined as the distance light travels in one over 299,792,458 of a second. <laughs> No. <laughs> um, just remember 300 million, right? 300 million is a nice, nice easy number to memorize. Right? 300 million meters per second is the speed of light. Right? So the distance of a meter is just the opposite, right? How far travel light travels in one second. Or in not in one second, but in one fraction of a second. 300 million meters per second, sir. Light travels 300 million meters per second. Yes. Okay, time. How long is one second? Well, one second is equal to 9,192,631,770 vibrations of a cesium-133 atom. So basically, we've got an atom of cesium. We've got an electron out here in the shell. And the electron's kind of like bouncing back and forth between two different states. It's vibrating. And so once we measure 9 billion, 192 million, blah, 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 vibrations, that is equal to one second. Okay. So what's the uh, approximation of one second is equal to? Nine, nine million, nine, 200. Yeah, about like 9.2 billion. <coughs> right. So I know this sounds silly, right? Like, who cares about this? <laughs> But this is actually very, very important because this is the basis of what we call atomic clocks. Like it's the most accurate way to measure time that we know. Of. And you all make use of atomic clocks in your everyday life. In fact, I guarantee that probably 90% of this class is going to make use of an atomic clock tomorrow. When do you make use of an atomic clock? Like <laughs> Who here is planning to use GPS tomorrow? No. <laughs> GPS relies on atomic clocks because it, they need to be synchronized and then they need to be measured down to a very, very fine detail of time 
right? Because the GPS measures like how long it takes for your signals to go to the satellites and come back and kind of like the drift in the amount of time. And that's how it's able to pinpoint your location. So you make up, you make use of this right here every time you use your GPS. Yes. So, um, this definition is not required, sir. Variation of a cesium. Mm -hmm. Make sure you know this. Minus 733 atoms. Cesium 133. Oh, is it? It's got cesium 133. That's just a dash, not a minus. Will we have to know that, sir? Yep. Make sure you know this one. Variation of a cesium 133 atoms. I'll ask about, if, I, if you can see the word cesium 133, make sure you know it's for time. Right? This isn't a way to measure distance. It's not a way to measure temperature. It's not a way to measure mass, right? This is how you measure time. But is that just for one second? So they put one second is equal to the vibrations of a cesium 133 atoms? Yep. Okay. And sir, is it, it is 9.2 billion watts, I'm sir? not going to ask you to memorize that. No, but uh, I, like you said, approximately 9.2 billion, billion watts? Billion vibrations. Vibrations. Mm -hmm. Are we going to have to know like, how to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit? Yeah. No, I will not ask that. Oh, good. But you should know that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fahrenheit is 9 over 5 times Celsius plus 32. I do it the other way around. I put a little square. Other part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Celsius is Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 9 times 5. Hey, Siri. <laughs> okay, so that's the definition of cesium 133. Yeah. Right? Okay, those were our fundamental quantities, right? The basis of all other quantities. So the other quantities we have, the other units of measurement, are called derived quantities. Right? We use multiple fundamental or other derived quantities. We mix them together to create derived quantities. So velocity or speed, right? Meters per second. Meters is length divided by seconds, which is time, right? Making use of our fundamental quantities. Acceleration. Acceleration is meters per second squared. Once again, meters, right? Velocity by second. Mm -hmm. So meters is our distance, right? Our length, and then s seconds is our time. If you look at meters per second squared, you can actually write it as meters per second per second. Right? Meters per second is your time, or sorry, is your speed. Velocity. Your velocity. Seconds is your time, right? It's speed over time. That's all acceleration is, speed over time. Okay, other derived quantities. Work, right? Work is a, it has a very specific definition in science, right? If you're just sitting at your computer typing in stuff into your Word document, is that actually work? Well, better come over here and take a look. Work is force times distance, right? So work is measured by joules, and it's newtons, which is force, times meters. What is a newton? A newton is a kilogram times acceleration. It's mass times acceleration. That's force. Right? Actually, I have that right here, right? Force is mass times acceleration. Right? So you can see that we're making use of fundamental quantities. We're making use of derived quantities to create completely new quantities. And we take that, and we create even more quantities. And we take that and create even more quantities. We take these units and we can combine them in all these different ways to describe different things which are going on. How much work? How much power? How much force? How much momentum? What is the volume, right? Volume is a derived quantity. Volume is just length times itself three times. Length cubed, right? Length, right? Length with height, right? Three different directions. Volume is another derived Length quantity. Length with height. Mm -hmm. So these are all examples of derived quantities. Their basis, if you break it all the way down, is comes from these fundamental quantities, right? Time, length, and mass. So are we okay with this concept here? Are we gonna need to know which ones fall under um, like whether it's Fundamental or derived, yeah. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, that should be one of the main things you take out of this. Okay. And so this is 
an example of those derived quantities. I know, it looks a lot like physics, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Not really. Not really, okay. I It's in your book. It's in your book. It's in your book. And if it's not in your book, it's on the internet. And um, were we getting these PowerPoints or was that the past class? Are you getting these PowerPoints? Yeah, like what we turn in right now. Is that mine? Is it you want us to understand? I mean, I was excited. Mine is in all the detail. I've read it already. Just tell me. Just tell me. Just tell me. Sometimes when the exam is there, the time is very short. Okay. So, so here's the deal, right? Where we get. If I give you these PowerPoints at the beginning of the chapters, mm -hmm. then I am going to be much more likely to give you pop quizzes to make sure that you are actually mm -hmm. looking at the PowerPoints I gave you, right? No. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm giving you the PowerPoints, I expect you to actually be using You give us pop quiz anyway, so my teacher will give us pop quiz anyway. So mine doesn't happen before. No, I don't want pop quizzes. I don't want pop quizzes. Tell her down. You got a Give the prop quizzes to them. Whoever gets the prop quizzes now, give it to them. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Is that how it goes back? It's better to what's it called? Just give the prop So we'll discuss this at the end. We'll discuss this at the end. Can you go back to the chart? Let's keep going. Yeah. Thank you. And if you do need this chart, I'm sure that Samantha's also recording it. You can just ask her for a copy of the recording. And she keeps also taking the picture, so. Mr. Khan, you're a little spicy today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just sad that Whataburger is no longer spicy because they don't have that uh, jalapeno biscuit. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Recognized. <laughs> Acknowledged. All right, so moving on. We do have a third type of unit of measure, which is radiographic quantities. So these are specific to radiology. And you've learned these before, haven't you? Mm -hmm. That's right. This is the Coulomb per kilogram, the gray, the siever, the Becquerel, right? These are radiographic quantities, our units of measurement in radiology. So Coulomb per kilogram, used to measure exposure in air. How many ions do we create in the air? How much, how many <laughs> electrons are we stripping, you. bless you. How many electrons are we stripping off atoms as these X-rays travel through the air. That is Coulombs per kilogram. Okay. Absorbed dose. Okay. The amount of radiation being absorbed by tissue, okay. measured by the gray. Dose equivalent. Okay. Equivalent dose, measured by Sieber. This looks at the type of radiation what kind of effect do type, different types of radiation have on biologic tissue? Sir, I have a question. What yes. do you mean by equivalent dose? The equivalent dose is you take absorbed dose, right? How much radiation was received by, by the tissue. tissue, and then you multiply it by the type of radiation, right? So if you have X rays, X rays actually aren't all that damaging. So the absorbed dose is the same as the equivalent dose. However, what if instead of X-ray radiation, you received neutron radiation? Or you received alpha radiation? Well, those are much more dangerous, right? One particle of X-ray, one X-ray photon versus one alpha particle, that alpha particle is gonna do much more damage. So we need to be able to um, take that damage into account. Right? So we change it by the weighting factor. So now we take our absorbed dose, we multiply by the extra damage it causes, so times 20, 
and that is our equivalent dose. So yes, we receive the same number of particles, but the alpha radiation is 20 times more damaging, 20 times higher dose compared to X-rays. That is equivalent dose. And there's actually an additional one, which I don't have here, which is called effective dose. That takes into account the type of tissue which is affected, right? Because some tissues are more sensitive, some tissues are less sensitive. Right? So we can also take that into account as well. But equivalent dose by itself, right? dose equivalent, this just takes into account the type of radiation. X-rays, gamma rays, beta particles, alpha particles, um, low energy neutrons, high energy neutrons. Whatever it is, we will take a look at how much damage it causes and change our dose based off that. We'll make sure to account for that damage. Okay, so this is the sievert. Radioactivity. Okay, this is the number, this is about atomic decay, right? Disintegrations per second. So we measure this in terms of the Becquerel. Okay, and then air karma. We talked about this before, once again, measured in grade, right, joules per kilogram. So this is kind of a review from intro to rad tech, right? You still remember this, I hope. Mm -hmm. right. Great. Alright. So here are our quantities, and over here we have the SI units, remember? SI units are the ones that we really care about. Standard, the old style units, it's good to know them still, right? If you look, do any research, a lot of the old material will be using these units. But this is what you should really care about for the registry, this SI units. The registry will ask you about coulombs per kilograms. It will not ask you about Rentkins. It will ask you about grays. It's probably not going to ask you about rad. It's going to ask you about sievers, probably not rad, okay? So make sure you pay attention to your SI units and what they measure. Okay. Any questions so far? Are we okay? Mm. A lot of this feels like review? Mm. No. <laughs> okay. Well, we are going to talk about some slightly new stuff here, which is equipment. Because equipment can come in all different forms. We have mobile equipment. Right over here, we have a mobile x-ray machine that you will see in clinic tomorrow. This, we call this, the, uh, this is CareStream. Actually, has anyone paid attention to the news recently regarding medical devices? Mm -hmm. I, I know that's a, a very niche topic. Um, but uh, CareStream, if you've been following the news, CareStream, I think, actually recently filed for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because CareStream was probably the number one provider of radiographic film. Mm. Right? They actually, um, I think, were either acquired or were part of Kodak. So they were a big manufacturer of radiographic film. But guess what? No one uses X-ray film anymore. Right? People use digital X-rays now. They don't use film anymore. So a big part of their business model became obsolete. They never really were able to make such big inroads into the digital market, so they ended up filing for bankruptcy, I think, last month. So what was the name of the company? Care Stream. Am I gonna ask you about that? Probably not. <laughs> Maybe a bonus question, who knows? Wait, what was the name of the company? <laughs> Care Stream? Care Stream. Care Stream. Just for bankruptcy. Got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no promises, okay, no promises. <laughs> so, mobile equipment, right? Equipment you can move around. Permanently installed equipment. You've got a tube head assembly, which is made of a tube, collimator, and tube stand. The control console and the wall unit. So let's take a closer look here. The x-ray room. Okay, we've all seen what an x-ray room looks like because we've been in lab. In the x-ray room, there is lead, or lead equivalent, shielding in the walls, doors, and floors. Okay? 
Upgrades or a replacement of the permanently installed equipment will require the entire room to be taken out of service. So if they're upgrading the X-ray machine, well, naturally you can't use that room. Right? So um, I don't think you were around for when they were installing the room two, but we used to have X-ray room two as our lab room. And then they installed a new machine there. So during the four months while they were doing that, we moved over to our current X-ray room three as our lab room, and we've stayed there ever since. If you look over here, this is an example of what the lead shielding looks like inside the X-ray room. Okay. So over here, you've got a giant plate of lead, right, which is bolted onto the wall. And this lead can be anywhere between 1 over 32 of an inch to 1 over uh, to one eighth of an inch thick, depending on what applications you are using it for. Would the bolts also be lead? Um, or are they just the, like a no, uh, negligible size? It's a good question. That I do not know. This drywall no. screw with lead disc. I don't know if there's like a washer on it that's made of lead. It may mm -hmm. screw it in or something. It does say. I do see this thing here that says a lead batten at the joints. I'm not yeah. sure what a batten is, but I assume it's something used to kind of shield that area. Okay, so they could use like a normal screw and just have like a lead barrier behind it? Seems so. Okay. Over here we have our x-ray tube. Right. x-ray tube is actually a lot smaller than this. It's maybe about this size, almost like a light bulb. Okay. Very fancy light bulb, you could say. It converts our electrical energy into x-rays. And remember, anytime we produce x-rays, we are also going to produce heat. Like heat is produced as a byproduct. We have two ends of the x-ray tube, the anode and the cathode. Hey, let me, which one is the positive end and which one is the negative? <laughs> Anode is positive and cathode is negative. negative. Very good. Okay. So over here, this is the side of the filament. Why this don't is we have such a nice book in this hundred and twenty dollar book? So what is that? Why don't we have such this nice picture here in this book? You, you'll no, have no. to ask the author. <laughs> well, in the spring, when we go, if we end up going to Wichita Falls for TSRT, you know. You may actually get a chance to meet Dr. Johnston, who is one of the authors of this book. So at that point, you can ask him. There's an amazing image in my teacher's PowerPoint. How about you consider using that for your next edition of the book? But this isn't my picture, right? This is something I saw on the internet. I'm a huge fan. All right. So all your work. This tube is encased in the metal housing, right? So that thing sitting over there on the table. Right? That metal housing. It's filled with oil. The oil is there to help conduct away the heat. It's there to help cool the tube gas. And then we also have cooling fans that help remove heat from the oil and just blow it out into the room. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's like insulating oil. Okay, this thing, everyone recognize this thing? Yeah, that's right, it's our collimator. It's the thing that, what's this middle button here? That's right, that's the light. It's the thing everyone loves to push. So, this is the thing that's underneath the tube, right underneath the protective housing. And the purpose of the collimator is to restrict the X-ray beam. So if you increase collimation, what is happening to the light? Smaller. Decreasing. Great. Smaller. It's decreasing. Okay. So how does this work? There are two pairs of lead shutters. If you ever look into the bottom of it, right, you've got some things that go like this, and you've got some things that go like that, right? And that is how we can change the size of our collimation of our light. 
Okay, one knob is adjusting, one knob adjusts the width. Inside here, we also have a light source, right? You've got to have a light bulb. There's a mirror, and then there's a clear, clear plastic covering with a crosshair drawn on it. So that is what produces our crosshair projected onto the bucket. What is the process? I'm sorry. The shadow. The X. That's your crosshair. Or the one that we see on the screen. The light. The one we see on the shadow. So, it's important that we have a mirror in the collimator. Why? Why do we have a mirror in here? What is the purpose of that mirror? What do you think? Reduce like scatter. Reduce mm -hmm. scatter. No, I think to reflect the image. To reflect the image or? Oh, oh. Something. Um. Reflect light. Reflect light. Why would we need to reflect light? The, the way that we're looking at that, yeah. so that the image comes out how we're looking. Image comes out how we're looking. All right, so let me ask you something. So here's our collimator, right? Light comes out straight down this way, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's say that the light bulb's oh, right here in the middle. What's above the collimator again? The tube. the tube, right? What does the tube do? It shoots the x-rays, right? So the x-rays come out of the tube, mm -hmm. they come down here through the collimator, and they come out. So what are the x-rays going to pass through? The light bulb. Oh. So, do you want your pictures with a light bulb in the middle of every single person's chest? Yeah. No, that's, that doesn't sound good, does it? So how do we take a picture without having a light bulb in the middle of a patient's chest? Well, we take the light bulb, then we move it over here to the side. So now the x-rays can pass through without shooting through the light bulb, right? But if the light bulb's over here, how does the light come out down here? Like it bounces yeah. With a mirror. Very good. You put a mirror right here, so the light bounces this way, and then it bounces that way. Uh -huh. So the light bulb is on the side. So the light bulb is on the side. Very good. Here's the light bulb. Here's the mirror. So the light bulb shines the light this way, and then it bounces down the collimator. Does that make sense? That's why the side of the tube is always like kind of hot after we're done using it. Correct. That's why the side of the tube is hot, because that light bulb is right here on the side of your tube. Mm -hmm. All right, so. Why the, is the mirror not in the middle of the image? So the mirror is just a flat object, so you're not gonna be, it's not gonna show up. In fact, we will learn later that the mirror actually helps to filter out low energy X-rays. X-rays that do not contribute to the image, but would contribute to patient dose. So the mirror actually helps protect the patient against excessive dose. So it's not entirely radiolucent then? Correct, it's not entirely radiolucent. Right. So the first piece of the mirror is to reflect the collimator light. This keeps the light bulb from showing up in the image. It also makes sure that the light is about the si same size, same direction as your actual x-rays. Right. Down here, we have that clear plastic sheet with the cross here, the X drawn onto it. So that's how we can shine the X onto our bucky, figure out exactly where we are. Excuse me, sir. Yes. So what, what is the purpose of the light then? To see where you're shooting. It's to see where the X-ray beam will be. Because you can't see the X-rays, and you don't want to be exposing X-rays, even if you could see them. So we have the light show us where the X-rays will be. Now, the problem with this setup, if you bump this mirror, your light's gonna be shining somewhere else, isn't it? <laughs> so you can accidentally bump the mirror out of alignment, and then you would need to call engineering or call biomed to fix the light. And that the whole room is taken out of like, play. Right. It usually doesn't take very long, though, so. The problem is getting biomed to come in in the first place. <laughs> So we have something called quality control tests. Right? So we check to see where the light field is and make sure it matches our X-ray beam. So this is called congruence. But you will see this word again, congruence. Make sure you remember it. In fact, the seniors are about to see this word um, in their classes because we're about to talk about this. 
Okay. Few more things. How can we set up this X-ray tube? Well, in our lab room, where is the X-ray tube located? Ceiling. Right, on the ceiling. You've got those rails on the ceiling, right, where you can move the X-ray tube around, float it around. So that is called the overhead tube assembly, the ceiling mount. But if you want a room that's slightly less fancy, maybe you don't need as much movement, you have floor mounts. Right? You've got just a single rail on the floor here. You've got a stand, and the X-ray tube is attached to it. So it can't move sideways, right? It can only move back and forth. But that's all you need to change the SID from 70 to the 40 and back, right? So if all you're doing is shooting things at a wall, you don't need to worry about a table, you could use a floor mount. Now, X-ray tube is kind of heavy though, right? I don't know if anyone's tried picking that up, but that is kind of heavy. So if we want to be a little bit more secure, right? we don't want this thing toppling over, we can also mount this to a rail on the ceiling as well, right? One on the floor, one on the ceiling. So same thing, it moves back and forth, but now it's less likely to fall over. This is our floor ceiling mount, or floor wall mount. Does that make sense? So it's just a little bit better secured. But of course, if you want maximum freedom, overhead mount is the way to go. So wall bucky could be used with all three of these. So let's take, so kind of like explaining what I mentioned earlier about these tube stands. For a mount, right, it's got the same single rail on the floor. It can only move one way, forwards and backwards. Okay. Lateral movement, if it wants to move in and out, right? You've got this here, you can cut, like pull it out this way, push it in that way, but it doesn't move very far. Okay, Less stable than the floor to ceiling mount because there's nothing holding the top in place. Okay. Speaking of the floor to ceiling mount, this one rides on the two rails, right? One on the floor, one on the ceiling. Okay. Once again, only moves longitudinal. It only slides along the rails here. Lateral movement, once again, telescoping arm. So you can pull it out a little bit, but it doesn't go very far. More stable than the floor mount. Right? Held in place in two positions. But when you go out to clinic, most of the machines you will see are ceiling mounted. Two rails, both of them on the ceiling, usually color coded. It gives you both longitudinal movement and lateral movement, right? So you can go longitudinal along your green, lateral along your blue, right? So most flexibility in terms of movement. You can move it in the most directions compared to the other two. So any questions about these three here? Can anyone come up with any reasons why we would not use a overhead tube mount, right? This seems like the best one, right? Why would we ever use one of these floor mounts or floor to ceiling mounts? And you cannot make a patient move so or lie down. Right. So mm -hmm. let, let's not think about the patient. Let's think about you are the director of the hospital. You need to buy equipment for an x-ray room. Why would you buy this kind of equipment for a room instead of this kind of equipment? Well, no. Let's see, John's. When the room is hella small. When the room is hella small. <laughs> and also you can move okay. these things and that it cannot be moved is permanently fixed. And okay, yeah. so yes, why would we want to use something that's more fixed? So yes, maybe the room is small. You don't have enough room on the ceiling for the rails. What other reasons could there be? What do you guys think? I see you. Is the, like, you gotta have specific, or? specific areas with equipment. All right, so ICU is specific areas with equipment. Hmm. So normally ICUs will not have built in. Well, I meant like uh, not ICUs, like mo mostly like let's say interventional areas or specific X-ray, like a specific X-ray room in a department. 
okay, a specific extreme room in the department. So maybe you've got these ceiling mounts in some other rooms, but for this one specific room, you would use this instead. Okay. Probably cheaper. Very All right, money. Money. Yes, as the director of a hospital, <laughs> <laughs> money is always on your mind. Good point. That's right. Let's see, Reagan, did you have something? I was going to say it's probably Okay, cost less, <laughs> cheaper. Good. All right, anyone else? We already took into account space. Uh, space. space. Um, would it be the type of, like, are we are we taking into account the type of tube or like if it's a? Um, okay, so um, let's see. What if? Let's say. So let's kind of go with that idea of you already have some ceiling mounted rooms, and you're gonna get this for one specific room. So now the question is, why would we get this? What's the purpose of getting this for one specific room? In that case, right? So let's think about it. If you are at a hospital, right? If you're in control of the hospital, right? And you're looking at the kind of patients you're getting, the kind of exams you're getting here. What if the majority of the x-rays are chest x-rays? Do you need to buy a full ceiling mount just to do chest x-rays. No, that's right. You could go cheaper, right? And get one of these to specifically just do chest x-rays. Right? Just take this, aim it at the wall, leave it at 72, and just take chest x-rays all day long in that room. And then you can use the other rooms for your other exams. So there are just because these aren't as fancy as your overhead mount doesn't mean that there aren't times you would see them. Yes, Reagan. So, if, so does that mean like the overhead tube would be better for like, a, like different kinds of exams? Mm -hmm, correct. So if you're expecting a large variety of exams, chest, abdomen, spine, head work, um, then yes, you would want an overhead mount because that gives you the most flexibility. Few more things to talk about as far as equipment goes. Table, we talked about the table in lab, right? When we talk about the table, what is the most important thing you should do with the table? Oh, All right, great, I heard three good answers. Line your tube up with the bucky in the table. Excellent answer. Lock your table when the patient gets on and off, definitely. And of course, raise your table to your height when you're working, right? You don't want to be the hunchback of LBJ. <laughs> you want to have the table up at your height so that you avoid back pain for as long as possible. So tables do have a four-way floating top. You notice that you can slide the table around all over. Okay. It comes with electromagnetic locks operated with foot pedals. Right? So you hold down either like that leftmost or rightmost button and it lets you float the table. You let go, it locks the table in place. Now, electromagnetic, what does this mean? That it stops by itself when it's at a certain SID, no? Mm, no, what does electromagnetic specifically mean? It's, Break the word down. It's magnetic it's because of electricity. Yeah, it's electrical as a magnet. Okay, electrical as a magnet. Oh. It's magnetic because of electricity. Okay. So, Let's see the power goes out in the department. Will this lock? No. No. If your power goes out, your table is suddenly a free floating table. Right? So if you've got a uh, if you've got a patient on there and the power goes out, your patient's gonna go clunk <laughs> until the table stops, right? So be careful of that. Just keep that in mind. Hopefully it will never happen. But if it does, right, be aware that you need to go in and help um, secure the patient because the table will be free floating. And by secure them, you mean like try and get them off of the table, right? Not just like leave them there? Well, it's gonna be hard to get them off the table because you know when they like try and scoot to get off the table, mm -hmm. you know, the table's gonna be flying back and forth. Right? So if you do wanna get them off, you'll need to be there like really holding the table still so that 
they can get off safely. Until the power gets back on or whatever. Right. Or just be there holding the table still and wait for the power to come back on normally while they stay on the table. Okay, underneath the table you have this thing here. What do we call that? Cassette. The cassette. That's right. Down here is the bucky. And the bucky holds our IR, it holds the cassette. Okay. In addition to the cassette holder, you have this thing right above, which holds the grid. So the grid is also part of this bucky assembly. What is the grid? Um, for now, think of a grid as a greediness reduction imaging device. Right? It reduces how grainy or how staticky an image looks. We'll talk more in detail about that later. But a grid improves image quality, it makes your image look more clear. All right. Has anyone peeked in any of the other rooms to look at this thing here? The horoscopy table. If not, you will get a chance to see this tomorrow in clinic if you're at the hospitals. So, fluoroscopy, x rays in motion, correct? With our fluoroscopy table, this table can move around. It has a motor, it has a drive. And this will move the tabletop. It can move side to side, it can move toward head to foot. So instead of that free floating table that we have on an x ray, uh, in an x ray room, this one, the movement is powered by a motor. You press the button, it slides towards you, away from you, towards the head, towards the feet. Okay? In addition, this table can tilt. It does not stay sideways. You can take this and flip the table straight up and down. Okay. You can even tilt it the other way. You can tilt the table back and forth like this. So you can actually have the table straight up and down. And down here is the footboard. The patient stands here. You do some pictures upright. They stay there on the table. You flip it sideways, and they're now supine. Does that make sense? Okay. So we can, you can move them between supine and upright. You can even move them Trendelenburg. What does Trendelenburg mean? The, the head down and head lowered in the feet. In the slant, so. Okay. Head lowered in the feet, right? Toward, head down. Right. So this is fluoroscopy. So I have a question. Yes. So when you said X-ray in motion, I felt that when the well, when the person is moving, then you're taking the X-ray, but that's not true. It's like you're able to take it in different positions. It's like an X-ray movie. So you're moving and moving the patient while you're taking the X-ray. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's like a video instead of a picture. Just think of a video. So mm -hmm. there's stuff going on inside the patient that's in motion, right? Like, let's see the patient swallowing. They're drinking something. You take a video so you can see the stuff going down the throat. X-ray movie. X-ray of movement, let's see. X-ray of movement. Yeah. Everyone recognize this thing here? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, I've got one right in the lab, right? <laughs> Good old X-ray wall stand. Okay. So, right, this thing can go up and down, okay? Depending, right? You have your bucky. Depending on your wall stand, you also may have the option to pull this out and stick a cassette inside. So you can, it, it can uh, hold the image receptor. That doesn't have to be made out of lead, right? Like, it's just the room and stuff around it? Correct, so okay. this is not made of lead, but the wall behind will be made of lead. Okay, and then here we have our control panel. So the control panel lets you, the radiographer, control the many parameters, the many different types of technical factors. So you may not know what these mean yet, but at the very least, I want you to um, kind of like be able to recognize or be familiar with these words. So we have something called KVP. Right? right, kilovoltage peak, the energy of our x-rays. We have MA, milliampere. We have MS, milliseconds. Together, MA and MS creates mass. Milliampere seconds. This is the number of x-rays we produce. Anatomic program. 
what anatomy are we looking at? Femur, knee, tip tip, feet, ankle, right? Focal spot. What part of the anode are we going to focus the electrons onto? This determines how sharp your image will look. This affects your image sharpness. AEC, automatic exposure control. Do I want to be a lazy tech and let the control panel decide what energies I should use? Or do I want to be an awesome tech and set the energy values myself? And then bucky selection. Right? Am I aiming this at the wall or am I aiming this at the table? How much more do I have? Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we'll go ahead and end this here. That's pretty much the end of our equipment anyway.